Why did Jesus even come to earth? That's a very important question I want you to ask yourself today as we go through the gospel. Today we're going to talk about love, and our scripture is John chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. If I told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Hmm. A lot of people have different theories about why Jesus came or who he even is. To some people, he's just a moral teacher. That's what they relegate him to. He just came to teach everyone to get along, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya and Why Can't We Be Friends. You have other groups. Modern liberals love to think he's some kind of social reformer who just so happens to agree with everything they believe. He came to encourage homosexuality, free love, and the idea that God doesn't judge people. Others want to think of Jesus as some kind of racial symbol of superiority. You've got the Aryans who say God and Jesus were thoroughly white and believed in the mastery of the Aryan race. You've got the black Hebrew Israelites who say Jesus was black and that he came to tell all white people that they're devils whom God hates. Basically, if there's an, if there's an ideology out there, you better believe there's someone who claims that was what Jesus was really about. Everyone wants to claim Jesus, but the Bible has something else to say entirely. Jesus isn't any of the things I've listed above. He's the Son of God in the flesh who came to die on the cross, resurrect from the dead in his glorified body, and make atonement for all of us depraved sinners to save us from hell. Every Christian should know the gospel by studying these verses. Every Christian can know the gospel by studying these verses. And I want to break the gospel down into four major aspects to this morning, this day. First, God so loved the world. John 3.16 is the most famous verse in the Bible. Even non-Christians know this verse. I knew this verse as a child. It was the first verse I ever memorized. It was the first verse I ever interacted with. And people at my church when I was a child loved to come up and ask me to quote it for them. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loves. That is who he is. This simple fact is at the core of the gospel and the core of our faith. If God didn't love, the truth is, not only would there be no Christianity, there wouldn't be a universe. It was God's love for everyone that inspired him to create. I don't know what word to use here. Inspired, compelled. My point is, God created because he loved. Now granted, many people misunderstand love. I heard one progressive who pretended to be a pastor of Christ claim that only the first half of this verse, for God so loved the world, well, the first fourth of this verse, was important and that the rest didn't matter. He said, why can't Christians just stop after that? Because a lot of people don't understand love. So we have to talk about what it means for God to be loving. The truth is, if we don't, then you won't understand the gospel message. <clears throat> Excuse me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The apostle doesn't just say that God is one who loves. The apostle says God is loving. He says God is love. As Christians, whatever our definition of love is, it needs to be in line with God. 
If it's not, then it's not love. We're going to look at gotquestions.org for a little support here because they have a great definition of love and I want to use it. Love is defined as affection, care, and compassion for another which originates in the triune Godhead. In short, love is a feeling of desire to be with and care for someone, but it's more than just a simple feeling. It's an action as well. You want what's best for that person because you love them. On the other hand, claiming you love someone while supporting them in or even encouraging them to sin, that actually means that you hate that person. Now, I am not a father yet. I do not have children, but God willing, I will be a father one day. If my son or my daughter came to me and told me that they were using heroin and that they loved it, I wouldn't just smile and say, good for you, son, good for you, daughter, whatever makes you happy, whatever makes you feel good in life. No, I do everything in my power to get them to stop, including destroying their supply if I ever found it. Society these days tells you if you don't support someone's decisions, even the bad ones, then you don't love them. But God's love is not like this. God's love is greater than anything you have ever experienced. God's love means he will call you out when you sin. God's love is great. Psalm 63, 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. Excuse me. Let me ask you this. What would make you happy? What is your greatest joy in life? For some people, it's money. Back in high school, we were asked in class one day what it meant to be successful, and a good number of the students said it was making as much money as you could. That was sad. I really hope that they've grown since then. But for others, it's being the life of the party. They want everyone to like them, and they can't stand it when someone doesn't. We've all met that person who just expects to be liked by everyone, and when someone doesn't, for whatever reason, they just fall apart. For others, it's status. They want to be known. They want to be respected. They want people to look up at them with admiration, whether it's because they're what society would consider an elite or because they've done something great. It doesn't matter. Some people's status is what would make them happy. Personally, none of these things matter much to me. You want to know what my greatest joy in life is? Let me tell you, it is the Lord God Almighty. He saved me. He loved me when everyone else gave up on me. Even when I gave up on myself, Jesus Christ was there. As a teen, I wanted to die. I didn't want to live. I hated the life I had. I hated the person I was. And it felt like everyone gave up on me. Everyone felt that I wasn't worth it. But Jesus cared. Jesus loved me regardless of what I had done. So yes, his love is better than life. And I'd gladly give up however many years I still have on this earth for my Lord. This world will fail you. Everyone will let you down in one way or another. There's going to be a day when I'm going to disappoint my wife. I just pray to God that it's going to be in something small and not something great. But God's love never fails. He never lets us down. One of my favorite worship songs, One Thing Remains, says this exact thing. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. And that's why he came for every single one of you. You want to know who God is? Let me tell you exactly who God is. Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is our God, great Yahweh himself. This is basically God's elevator pitch of get to know me in 30 seconds. Well, here are the basics you need to know. It's like those Facebook profiles where you get a few words to describe yourself. You know the one I'm talking about on your Facebook? Mine has something about food and loving to be outside, but also loving the Lord Jesus. And I'm sure you've got those on your Facebook or on your Twitter or anything like that. But my point is, this is God's bio. This is his description of himself. He is compassionate. He comes alongside us in our times of pain. He doesn't make the pain go away. He holds our hands through it. 
like a lot of people have said, God didn't make the Red Sea disappear. He didn't magically transport the children of Israel from one side of the sea to the other, but he walked through the sea with them. He is patient and he is forgiving. I cannot imagine how many times I would have lost my temper if the roles were reversed. If I was the one who had to be the patient and forgiving one and I had to deal with me when I was younger, even now if I had to deal with me, I cannot imagine how patient and forgiving the Lord must be. He is loving, he cares for you, and he is just. We broke his law and now we must be punished. Or at least, that's what you would expect. But God had other plans. This leads into point two of the gospel. Jesus' sacrifice was for everyone. We're going to read John 3, 16 and 17 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus bother coming down here? What was his point? What was his mission? Why is Jesus here to die for you? Yes, Jesus didn't come to judge. And that's because the judgment has already been passed. Hold on to that. We'll be back for it in just a few minutes when we get to point three. But I, will, I really want to focus on the purpose of Jesus here, on his sacrifice. God sent Jesus to save, and that's what he did. 1 John 4.10 and this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Ah, the Apostle John, one of my favorites. It's a tie between him and Paul as to who's my favorite New Testament writer. And it's a tie between him, Paul, and Elijah as to who's my favorite servant of the Lord in scripture, besides Jesus himself, of course. Anyway, the Apostle John, who I've often heard him called the Apostle of Love, and there's a lot of truth to that. The Apostle John speaks so much of God's love. Now, there's a lot to unpack in this verse, so be patient with me. First, people often question whether God really loves them, and this verse shows that he does. People often wonder, does God love me? Can God love me? Why would God love me? I'm here to tell you he does. He loved you. He still loves you. He sent Jesus for you. You were on his mind while he was hanging on that cross. What does it mean to be a propitiation? That's definitely not a word you come across on most bait on most days. In fact, I'm willing to bet that outside of church, you've never used that word in your life. And I know I'm going to lose that bet because I know someone's going to point out, well, you know, I've, I'm an English major, so I've used it. <laughs> but I'm willing to bet that most people don't use that word, propitiation. In short, propitiation means a payment which satisfies wrath. I want to borrow from Ray Comfort from Living Waters for a moment. He has an amazing example, amazing illustration he uses when he goes out and does his evangelism. And I'd like to borrow it now. So if you ever do watch this video, Brother Ray, thank you so much for your faithfulness to the Lord. You have really helped me. You've taught me so much. I know we've never met, but you've taught me so much. Anyway, here's the example. You're in court, and there's a stack of fines sitting in front of the judge that you're, with your name on every single one of those pieces of paper. You're guilty. There's no two ways about it. Because of justice, because the judge is a good, honorable, and just man, he's prepared to sentence you to a long time behind bars for your crimes. But just then, someone steps forward and offers to pay for your crimes, and the judge can set you free. I'm going to add my own little spin on this as well. Now imagine that that someone who offers to pay for your fines is the judge himself. He looks at you and he says, John, you're as guilty as they come. You deserve every ounce of punishment our justice system can bring down on your criminal head. But I'm going to take your place. That is propitiation. He came to take our place. He came to be what we could not. He also came to take what we were and make it new. He came to take away our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So why did Jesus come to earth? He came to die. 
He came to be sin. Every single one of us is a guilty sinner. If you try to tell me that you've never committed a sin in your life, well, then we can add lying to your list of offenses for today. It was your sin that nailed him to the cross. The gospel should be personal. Don't think about it in abstract terms, like the sin of the world, the sins of America, the sins of Israel, the sins of the race of man. Think of it as the sins of you. I think of it as this. It was the sins of John that nailed Jesus to that cross. But it was the love of Jesus for me that won in the end. A good way it's been explained to me is like this. On that cross, God the Father didn't see his beloved son, Jesus. He saw every sin ever committed by mankind, past, present, and future. Everything you've ever done. And he poured out his wrath, every ounce of his divine wrath. Every time your sin hurt God, every time you've angered him, every time you've failed him, and however many times you've done it, add twice that number for the times I've let him down. And that was all counted against Jesus. Every single sin. Can you imagine? Imagine one person committing every single sin that's ever been committed and ever will be committed. That time you cursed out someone, that was put on Jesus. That time you cheated in school, that was put on Jesus. That time you disrespected your parents, that time you blasphemed the name of God, that time you hurt somebody just because you could, that time you cut someone off in traffic just because you wanted to, that time you looked at someone like an object, that time you looked at someone as less than a person, all of it was put on Jesus. And now, if we accept that gift, God doesn't see the guilty sinner. He sees his beloved son, Jesus, when he looked at the disgusting sinner who was called John Cox. He doesn't see me. He sees Christ. He sees the righteousness of Christ placed upon me. Why would he do that? Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. I'm sure each person listening to this sermon has someone who doesn't like them. Someone who's rude or disrespectful, hateful, even evil towards that per towards you. I want you to think about that for a second. Or think about the time that you've been that person to somebody else. Could you imagine giving up your life for that person? You and I were once God's enemies and yet he died for his enemies. That's why he did it. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to, because we were evil. We love to think of ourselves as good people. We've all heard that Luke Bryan song that says most people are good. But the truth is, none of us are good. If God only, if God only came to save those who weren't his enemies, then we'd all be headed for hell. And this is crucial for the gospel. God's love is shown to us by the fact that while we were still sinning, while we were still his enemies, rebels who spat in his face every waking moment of our existence, while we did all of that, Jesus died for us. Have you ever listened to the song Sunday is Coming by Phil Wickham? If you haven't, I cannot recommend that song enough. It is such a beautiful song. One line that really stands out to me is when he said, when he sings, he shed his blood to set us free. You and I were slaves to sin. No one is born free. We all serve someone. And unless it's God, you're serving sin. Jesus gave up his life to purchase you. We were all slaves of sin and death. And the only currency that could procure our freedom from such a cruel and vicious master was the blood of Jesus Christ. Now going back to those two racist groups I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, Jesus' death was for all people. I've often told people that Jesus didn't get up on the cross and say, all right, I'm only doing this for the people who look like me. 
The rest of you disgust me and either find your own way, which you can't, or go straight to hell. I don't really care. Jesus never said that because his sacrifice was for all of us. His sacrifice didn't exclude the white man, the black man, the man from Asia, the Native American, anyone. No one was excluded. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. This is the gospel, my friends. Our sins were crucified with the Lord Jesus. Your sins were nailed to that cross with him. We died when he took his last breath. And now, because he lives, we live. Why? Because of love. If you grew up in the church, then you might remember this old Sunday school song that goes, It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And I'm going to stop before I make someone's ears bleed with my singing. Excuse me. But my point stands. We were crucified with him. And all because he loves us. All because he cared for us. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. We are the friends of Christ, my brothers and sisters. He laid down his life. He set aside his glory. He stripped off his royal robes. He tossed his crown away. He threw away his scepter to step down into the mud of creation and lift out that drowning, disgusting sinner. Because he loved us. Because we are his friends. It would be foolish to not take his gift. And yet, some don't. And that leads into my third point about the gospel. We are condemned without Jesus Christ. Read verses 18 through 20 again. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Many people think that God can't condemn us to hell because he wouldn't be loving if he did. I've heard some people say that. I've heard some people say, God can't condemn me to hell. He loves me. But the truth is, people condemn themselves to hell. We love sin if we refuse to yield to God. I've seen incidents when a brother or sister in Christ will be sharing the gospel, and instead of hearing it, receiving it, and repenting, a crowd will gather to chant slogans of sin at them. You've heard them. You've heard the pro-choice slogans. You've heard the LGBT slogans. You've heard other ones that I can't think of at the, at the moment, but you've heard them. When a person gathers to preach, a crowd will form around them and chant slogans of hate, slogans of sin at them. The truth is, as much as these people chanting want to call themselves believers in God, they hate him. They love their evil deeds, and they hate the living God because he won't get behind them. C.S. Lewis once explained it, that people don't actually want a loving father in God. They want a senile old grandfather who cares more about everyone's feelings than he does about the truth. They want a God who just approves of everything, smiles, and doesn't say no. That's the God they want. God's love means the freedom to choose him, and that includes the freedom to reject him. Let me borrow from Dr. Frank Turek here. Ladies, suppose you know a man who says he loves you. You reject him, but he keeps trying. He sends you gifts, flowers, candy, whatever it is that you like. He sends it to you. He writes you songs and poems and love letters. He watches out for you in bad situations. He stands up for you when people are bullying you. It doesn't matter. My point is, he does all of this, and yet at the end of the day, you decide that you just don't want to be with him. Now, what if after so many times of rejection, that same man, instead of accepting your decision, 
decided to force you to love him. And yes, I mean that in the darkest possible way. And we're going to leave it there. Would he actually love you if he did that? Or would he prove to be selfish? God's the same way. He will never force his love on you. But you can't have his blessings without his love and fellowship. And oh boy, do we want his blessings without him. Men, have you ever been in a relationship with a woman who only cared about what you could do for her? Just as a side note, I do know that both genders can do this, but my last example was for the ladies, so let's direct this one toward the men, okay? Anyway, you pour out so much time and energy into a marriage only to find out at the end of the day that she never loved you. She just loved your possessions, your money, your status. She loved you for what you could do for her, not because of who you were. Would you be wrong in taking away your benefits when you took away yourself and your love? Of course, the answer to that is and should be a resounding no. God's benefits are a package deal with him. You cannot have one without the other. And yet many people want exactly that. They don't want God, but they want heaven. They don't want God, but they don't want hell either. But those are the choices. You either love God and commit to him, or you don't love God and you accept the consequences. Back to Lewis for a second. He explains that hell is God giving the sinner exactly what they thought they wanted, and there's no take backs in the end. You don't want God? You just want yourself? Well then, yourself is all you'll ever have. The truth of the matter is, we are judged. We are condemned. We are guilty, and there is going to be a day where we will answer for it. Acts 17, 30 through 31. Therefore, having overlooked times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We don't like to think of God as judging, but the words are right there, plain as day. Literally translated, one day you will stand in front of Jesus Christ and you're going to give an account for everything you've ever done. Jesus himself says this time and time again, you will one day soon be judged by God. Are you guilty or are you innocent? You might think you're innocent. A lot of people do. Proverbs 21.2 even says, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. But the Lord weighs the hearts. Society tells you to follow your heart. If you want something, go after it. If you want to do something, do it. And yet we wonder why there are so many people who break the law. Because your heart wants evil. God knows what's in that heart of yours. That disgusting or unacceptable urge you have, God knows. That lie that you're longing to tell, that true feeling that you have about someone, those evil things that you want to do, God knows. And too often we act on those feelings. We get drunk, we sleep around, we smoke, we lie, we cheat. We hurt others, we steal from others. We only look out for number one because that's what our hearts tell us to do. It's not a long distance from your heart to your hands. And this applies to everyone. No one is free from this condemnation for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The truth is, we all bear this guilty sentence. So if you had any delusions that you could stand in front of Jesus on Judgment Day and call yourself innocent or a good person on your own merit, I suggest you toss them aside. They will do you no good. Those ideas are useless. Like I've said many times, there's a quote that says, everyone has a date with deity. One day you will stand before God for judgment. Revelation 20. 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. 
and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All people, both men and women, will stand and be judged. The outcome is only one of two options. You will only hear one of two on that day of judgment, so listen closely. First, you are a guilty sinner, and you have made no atonement, no payment for your sins. You are condemned for your rebellion against the king and justly sentenced to eternal separation from his, pr from his presence. You are exiled from his kingdom into outer darkness. You are denied his great benefits. Leave the presence of the Lord God Almighty, you guilty sinner. That's option one. Doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? Here's option two. You are guilty of rebellion against God. You have failed to live according to his standard of righteousness and cannot atone for your sins. You deserve to enter the fires of torment for eternity, separated forever from the presence of the king. But someone else has made payment on your behalf. Only Jesus pays. Only Jesus can pay. The rest of us are condemned without him. What does it mean to have your name written in the book of life? If your name is in this book, then guess what? You're a saved human who has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But if not, then the other books come into play. These are God's records. Think of them as the charges that are being read out against you in court. Everything you've ever done, said, or thought is written in them. And if you have not taken God's gift, then you are condemned to the lake of fire. Everyone from Hitler and Stalin to Muhammad and Darwin to Buddha and Gandhi will be punished for their rebellion against God. Look at the warning from John the Baptist recorded in Matthew 3.12. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So my friend, are you wheat? that will be gathered into the barn and stored by the Lord? Or are you useless chaff that will be burnt up? It's time to make a decision. Let me give you an illustration about this gift of God and why it must be accepted, why you must accept it. Let's say that you're sick. I mean, deathly ill. You're as sick as you could get. And I come to you with a wrapped package and I promise you the cure for your illness is within. I won't open it for you, but I give it to you. I won't force it on you. I give it to you, and you have to make the decision. Instead of opening it, you decide not to open the box. Maybe you don't believe me. Maybe you don't believe that the cure is in there. You think I'm just pulling your leg or having a joke at you. Or maybe you think your disease is too far gone and it, nothing can help you. Maybe you think another cure will present itself with time, or maybe you don't believe you're as sick as everybody says. Maybe you think you're actually healthy. Regardless of what your reason, you, choose, you refuse the gift and you die. Does this sound familiar? We are all infected with a terrible illness. It is called sin. Each and every person listening to me today has been infected with this pandemic and it is deadlier than any plague mankind has ever faced. Deadlier than the bubonic plague, deadlier than typhoid, deadlier than tuberculosis, deadlier than the Spanish flu, deadlier than COVID or Ebola. And only one cure is out there, Jesus Christ. But if you don't receive his gift and open that box, his shed blood will do you no good. In the midst of all our sins, God is still loving. We were all condemned guilty in the court of the universe of creation itself. There was no way for anyone to live innocently. And yet God was not pleased to cast us off as failures, though we certainly were. No, his love is new every day and he has always reached out to his creation to redeem them. You are condemned without him, this is clear, but with him, you are free. So how does this look? This leads into my final point. How should we live? in this gospel. Remember, we've talked about the love of God, we've talked about the sacrifice of Christ, we've talked about the condemnation of man. Now let's talk about how the gospel should transform you. 
1 John 3, 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. We are God's children. There's a false idea out there that everyone is automatically born a child of God. I talked about it earlier, you remember. Everybody says, well, God wouldn't condemn me, I'm his child. No, you're not. We're all his creation, but we're not all his children. You become his child when you accept his free gift. Think of it as accepting God's offer to adopt you. You're not born into his family. Right now, you could claim to be something along the lines of just being babysat. But God is offering to adopt you. He won't force the adoption. You have to take the adoption of your own free will and agree to sign those papers, you could say. The world doesn't understand our family. How can it when it didn't understand Jesus? But the truth is, if you are God's family, if you are his child, there are certain things that are expected of you, not to save you, but out of love. I always say I don't do good because I expect it to save me. I do good because God saved me, because I love him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Some people act like this is a deal breaker. Some say that God's so demanding that he can't be loving. But let me tell you something that many people don't like to think about. Every relationship has stipulations and requirements. There's not a relationship you'll enter where you can do whatever you want with no consequences. Let me give you some examples. Your marriage. You're required to treat your spouse with respect. You're required to love them. You're required to not cheat on them or abuse them. Your children. You're required to raise them with both love and discipline to take care of their physical needs and again, not to abuse them. Your job. You're required to show up on time and do the job you're paid to do. Imagine using the same logic that people like to apply to God on either our jobs or our marriages. Imagine saying this to your wife. Honey, I know I cheated on you and I broke a few plates when you found out because I got angry, but if you leave, it means you're not loving because you don't accept me exactly how I am. Or how about this one? Hey boss, I know I've been showing up an hour late all week and not doing work while instead playing games on my computer and using a chat room to talk to people, but if you fire me, it's not fair and that makes you a terrible person full of hate. Do you see the flaw here? Do you see the flaw in our logic? We expect God to have a unconditional, unconditional relationship on our end while we hold him to conditions. And yet we have the, we put conditions on our spouses, on our jobs, on our children, and we expect our relationship with God to not have requirements? No. And what commands does Jesus refer to here? First is to love God. Yahweh, the Lord of heaven and earth, has shown us how we are to love him. And if we do love him, then we will do so with our entire being. We won't hold anything back from him. Everything in your life, from your home, your money, your spouse, your children, your body, all of it, should belong to Jesus Christ. And second, we are to love your neighbor like you love yourself. It doesn't say to only love those who are nice to you. It doesn't say to only love those who can benefit you. It doesn't say to only love those who make the same amount of money as you or who agree with you or who look like you or who live near you. It says to love your neighbor as yourself. Are they a human being? Then they're your neighbor. They're your neighbor if they're a human and you need to love them. It doesn't matter if they were just conceived in their mother's womb or if they're a 97-year-old man who's bitter about everything. God requires us to love them. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus says this to his disciples. My friends, Jesus has loved us with a love beyond our understanding. He extended that love to you and me, wretched sinners though we are. And we should do the same, love one another, for the Son of God has loved you. Don't wait for tomorrow to start loving. It may be too late by then. 
love. And what expression should that love take? Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Are you saved? I hope so. I do pray so. And if you are, it's time to share that gospel. It's time to invite more people to our family. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to share the gospel of our Lord. You can be a cook, a plumber, a maintenance worker, a teacher, a cab driver. Be careful though. Do not leave any part of his truth out when you share the gospel. Do not ignore the fact that all are sinners in need of salvation. Do not ignore the bloody death of Christ brought about by your own evil. Do not ignore his atonement or his resurrection. And do not ignore the Holy Spirit as he continues to call out to you. Jesus will be with you, so don't be afraid. This, my dear friends, is the gospel. The reason Jesus came, the reason we are Christians, Jesus came to die for you because he loves you. You're condemned without him. Excuse me. You're saved with him. And it's time to share that love with others. I have something I want you to do this week. And it's going to sound a little silly, but I want you to do it. Keep a piece of paper with you for the rest of today. Anytime you sin, whether in action, thought, or deed, sorry, action, thought, or word, write it on that paper. At the end of the day, I want you to sit down and look at that paper and read off every single one of your sins out loud to yourself. Don't share these with another person. Then I want you to take a red marker or pen or pencil or crayon, whatever you have that's at hand, and cover over it. Cover over that entire piece of paper to represent the blood of Christ. Cover them with so much red that you can't see any of your writing beneath. That is how the gospel works. We are covered with so much grace and so much blood from the Lord Jesus that our sins are buried. Anytime the enemy wants to throw your sins back at you, just remember that Jesus has washed you in his blood and your sins have been covered. What can wash me white as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer, my friends. Loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we are able to come here today, gather in worship of you. Lord, thank you so much that you love us. Thank you that your gospel is here for us. Thank you that you have made it a point to reach out to these sinners, to me. Lord, thank you. I pray that if anyone here today has not received your gift of salvation, that you would open their hearts to receive you today. That you would open their hearts to accept that gift, to remind them of your love. Lord, we know we're condemned without you. And thank you for not leaving us. Thank you for not abandoning us when we gave up on ourselves. Lord, give us strength, courage, and wisdom to share your gospel with the world now. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you, my King. Thank you, my God. May all glory and honor belong to you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone has come today to accept your free gift of salvation, then I just pray that you will pour your love upon them. Drown them in your love, Lord. Let them know that they are loved and that they have a family now in Christ Jesus, that we are their brothers and sisters, Lord. And please help me to love them as you love them. Help us all to love as you love. We thank you and we love you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Our benediction this morning comes from Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I pray that you'll accept that gift today, my brothers and sisters. Have a great day, and God bless all of you.